Unless one has an affinity for looking ridiculously foolish, it is wise not to stumble aimlessly into a fantasy football draft. The Ultimate Draft Kit from the Fantasy Footballers contains all the information you need to avoid the jeers of your enemies and to snuff out any glint of hope in their souls. Imagine the gasps those trouser-wearing turnips will emit as you make yet another triumphant draft selection. Imagine their tears forming a formidable puddle as you assemble an unstoppable force. The ultimate draft kit comes bursting at the seams with fantasy goodness. When you enter the draft room, you'll feel as if you were a monstrous beast let loose in a chicken coop. Head over to ultimatedraftkit.com today. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in! Ferocious. I'm one with nature, Mike. I mean, that was a, it's a big jump there going from best friend of the show, Davey A, right into that, that growl, that warrior scream. Welcome into the show. The Fantasy Footballers back with you. Mike Wright, Jason Moore, Andy Holloway. Tuesday, May 19th, episode uh, 886. We give episode numbers now? I... I chose to. <laughs> you went to spitballers here mode and right there. there. Here and there we give them. <laughs> when you started saying the number and you're like 800 and I just thought you were making a number up. You know, like, right. oh, just show 8 billion. That's that's a legit number. That's probably the right number. Eight Are we going to hit 1,000 this year? Or like, who's yes. done the math on this? <laughs> it's You having a hard time with yes, it, we, Mike? I am confident based on math that we will hit it this year. Yeah. It, it's going to be one at a time, though. And Ooh, then we'll get there. That's true. <laughs> we have a very fun episode today. Some say the best. It's explain yourself. We're looking mm. at our inaugural rankings, some of the debates that we've had internally, some of the kind of standout rankings from each of our lists. So we're going to have an opportunity to explain ourselves and maybe, maybe persuade. I mean, that's part of what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. We're trying to persuade you. I'm trying to persuade these two gentlemen and vice versa. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You got me before when you splain yourself. Oh, you got splained. Not with carry on, though, did we? <laughs> Not with I old carry on. I think you've got him this year. <laughs> just, <laughs> maybe. Just you wait. <laughs> uh, at the FF Ballers on Twitter, youtube.com slash the fantasy. Footballers, subscribe, click the bell, follow us uh, wherever, wherever the social media wherever, man, platforms are. We're, we're everywhere. <laughs> and uh, appreciate everybody over at jointhefoot.com. We just posted a new update over there about things going on. Very exciting time. Despite all of the kind of tumult around us, we have a lot of great things planned for 2020. Planning on upgrading the website. We've got the Ultimate Draft Kit launching on... June 1st, which is right around the corner. So uh, you can check that out at ultimatedraftkit.com. But it's going to be a fun year. All right. Quick question of the day. Now that you've been through all 32 teams, what was the toughest team for you to stat out to pre predict, project for 2020? Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in here first. For me, it's the Chargers. Um, you have a, a myriad of different things, both good and bad, happening for this team. I think their offensive line has been majorly improved. Uh, I think their quarterback situation, despite my uh, you know bad words towards Philip Rivers on a personal level uh, for what he did to my fantasy team, because you guys are very, I mean, it's back and is, forth, back and forth. You guys, yeah, me and Phil, we go back and forth. He likes mm -hmm. to talk trash. I like to talk trash. He knows that, but. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the interceptions for my fantasy team were, I wasn't having that. Um, but oh, the reality but so is, he's good. A, they were so good for the show. Just for he's the a, yeah. Um, 
Uh, he's a borderline Hall of Famer, and he's a guy that checks down to the running back. So when you look at Justin Herbert coming in, a prospect I wasn't personally too high on, is he going to start the season? Is he not? Uh, Tyrod, who doesn't historically throw the ball to the running back, but the improved offensive line, the great schedule to start the year. Uh, there's so many different variables that you can't really – you. There, there's no sure way to predict them uh, the way that there there are with you know teams that have more uh, congruency and so to me that that was one of the the more difficult teams to stat out. I had to essentially guess uh, how many games I think Tyrod will start. I split the season. I didn't have Herbert starting, um, and then you know divvy up the stats according to having you know, two thirds of the year with a rookie and a third of the year with Tyrod. And, and it, it was just difficult because there's a lot of good weapons there. Eckler, Keenan Allen, Hunter Henry, Mike Williams, just some really important fantasy options that at the end of the day in my rankings kind of suck. Yeah. They're, they're a tough team to stat out. Uh, Keenan Allen, I had a hard time with, I mean, we've seen elite wide receivers struggle with, with transitioning at the quarterback position and you have to kind of make a determination whether you're buying into that or whether you think one of those other guys is going to be able to get him the ball. So they're difficult, no doubt. Mike, who do you have as your uh, most difficult team to stat out? I went with the Rams. Uh, they are a complete mystery to me just across the entire team, except we know Jared Goff will be the quarterback. Uh, which Jared Goff will we see? Last year's or two years ago where he looked like he was improving and becoming an actual, like a top 12 fantasy guy, the running back position, who boy, that, that, thing is, <laughs> that thing is a mess, but it's also, I, you feel like the kid where, you know, back when you had your dino set where it's just, it's tar, it is just, it's a, it's a tar pit, but you know, if once you start pulling things out, you're going to have some dinosaur bones, you're going to put them together and you got an awesome new toy. We could see Cam Akers emerge and be an absolute fantasy did you, beast. Did you, did you play with play with a lot of a lot of tar as a kid? You never had the did, dino sets? No, I oh, well. I saw that's... Andy's face was right with me and and the, we did not play with the tar. But I get the analogy, right? The offensive line is the tar pit. Look, you guys hoping... missed out because I was super into science. <laughs> I was and... playing with tar as a kid. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't playing with Joe's. I didn't have those. I had dinosaur kits where I was okay. learning about pterodactyls. No, and it serves you at times like this. Yeah, perfect. When you need a real solid analogy. So you, Go you, on. Have the, you have the problem with the running back position. Then you have the problem with the wide receiver position slash tight ends of the, the wide receiver for the Rams. It's been an excellent position. Cooper Cup, Robert Woods should be primed to be absolute fantasy studs with, with Brandon Cooks being shipped out of town like they should easily be two top 20 two top 15 wide receivers for fantasy as they have been in the past but then we saw this five game stretch where the rams completely renovated their offense they went to more of a 12 personnel where the the, the tight end was featured so then you have the problems with tyler higby is can higby keep that going because if he does he's like a top three tight end it, or does he vanish back to what he has been for four years the rams are like the the, the outcomes for each individual position is so bipolar for for the Rams. I'm uh, they're they so they are my most difficult team to actually stat out. Yeah, and I went with the Patriots because not only do they confuse me, but I don't I don't want anybody. I don't have any Patriot above twenty eight at their position, and that is the quarterback. Wow who's 28th at his position. I don't have any, but even if I see one of these guys drop to me, obviously Edelman would be the kind of one player that you could look at and say, well, okay, I'll get production, but he has the age variable. It's a defensive team. I, I'm just not excited. I wasn't, I didn't enjoy the process and I'm not excited about anybody there. Last year you came in with hopes for Nikhil Harry, who knows what he'll be with Stidham. Mm. I don't find myself uh, too excited with New England. Uh, it's I'm, fair. It's fair. I mean, except people are going to be real mad when Jared Stidham is winning more games than Tom Brady. Real, real mad. Oh, who's, who's people? The, the 
public Twitter. Is that an effect? You're, you're saying you're putting that on the record. You think he's, he's going to win Tom Brady? Mike's just throwing a hand grenade out there and <laughs> walking away. It's such the... Trying to be like, hey, you know, Stidham's going to win more games with Brady. Look, yeah, that, Mike, can have the, Mike can have that one. That's fine. Because uh, no, no, he won't. <laughs> I don't think so. I think this is going to be uh, a very interesting year. They might, they might still be able to win because of that defense and, and game management, but um, it'll be a battle of, of uh, you know, is this, is this Brady? Is this Belichick? I'm, I don't think that Jarrett Stidham is going to get it done personally, but uh, let's talk some news. News and notes from around the league. Uh, nothing that I would, you know, say is breaking crucial news to talk about, but some of the more off season rumory stuff, I'd rather get your reaction than not. So first you had, uh, let's go here. Mike Tomlin, Steelers head coach comes out, says James Conner is quote, a featured guy and a proven runner when healthy. Connor's another player that I think is difficult to project because uh, we've seen the struggles with health, but we've seen him be exactly that when he's healthy, a featured guy. You look at this team, you look at Mike Tomlin, he prefers he also a featured about guy. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, does last this year, beat reporters were coming out and saying that they believed it was going to be a timeshare. And and I feel like this is something that happens pretty much every year post Love Bell is like, I, I think it's not going to be the same, but it hasn't been until the hand was completely forced due to injury. And so, you know, this year, once again, people are saying, I think Benny Snell's going to share time with James Conner. Uh, I, I, for the first time when I was standing out the Steelers, I, I gave more work to that running back too. But, you know, he, having Tomlin come out and say that and knowing his history, it is, you know, if, if Conner were just healthy for the whole season, I, I can't he would imagine. Be great that he would not use him the way that he's used every uh, you know every lead back he's had on the roster. Well, I, yeah, and the thing is is when you stat him out, you have to do what you did. Unless you are going to 100% factor, you know, look at Connor and say he's going to be healthy throughout the year because even if he is the featured guy for 10 of the 16 games, the stats are going to bear out what you're saying. Yeah. So this didn't really change my opinion. I mean, Connor is sitting there and has been sitting there as this potential value because you're betting on a, you know, you could be betting on a healthier season and a healthier season for Connor. You should at least get another year out of him as a feature guy, right? Yeah, I, I 100% believe that. And you just like, where is he? I guess we we can look it up, but like you don't find three down running backs in the area that James Connor is currently being drafted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they. It it'll be interesting in general. And we'll talk more about Pittsburgh because uh, on explain yourself today, we'll be talking about Juju, so we can debate some of the optimism surrounding Big Ben's return. Big Ben put a big tweet out there Oof, today. God, he got mm. that fresh haircut because uh, I guess he wasn't going to explain himself. He wasn't going <laughs> to cut his hair. You think I'm going to explain myself because Big Ben cut his hair? It, that well, is, I, that's what I believe. I believe Big Ben put that video out to get <laughs> uh -huh. you to explain yourself. Well, here's what we at least know now is that picture that came out a couple weeks ago that we were all like, what happened to Big Ben Roethlisberger during quarantine? That was the answer. Like he apparently had said, I will, I'm not going to shave my beard. I'm not going to cut my hair until I can really throw a football again. And now he's all cleaned up, and you're like, oh, Ben's still under there. Like, he's back. <laughs> uh, Todd Gurley. Let's talk about him. Falcon, <laughs> The Falcons offensive coordinator, Dirk Cutter. Then that said, way, hold on. Which I want to clarify. Yeah, he's – Falcons offensive coordinator, Dirk Cutter, as, as in the offensive coordinator for the team that Todd Gurley is currently under contract with. Yes, that just signed him, Mike. Yeah, yes. like they, they have him on the team. Okay, yep. I'm yeah, just yeah. making sure. He said, quote, the main question is that no one seems to know is what is his health status? <laughs> well, okay. Th this is the quarantine world, right? I mean, it's harder. They're not seeing each other. They're not in the facilities with one another. Obviously, I, I, I believe he passed his physical. So, you know, the you know, there is a baseline of health. But when the when the coaches are coming out saying that that's a known worry that they don't have an answer for, 
you realize that a lot of times, and this is something we see during the draft, and we think teams have so much more information than we do. <laughs> That's what I was but thinking. But then too. you watch and you go, oh, yeah, they're humans that don't know everything about other humans. It's Where's just all the like secrets? Us. Well, they, they certainly some of these documentaries you see about um, the general managers at home, they're saying the same things we are. Who's going to go here? Maybe this guy's going to go there. They don't see, you know, they're following along like we were at home. Here we are with Gurley, and you have to wonder if GMs are backed into a corner saying, well, if I'm going to get him, I got to make him the offer now. They should have been on that Bleacher Report feed. Somehow those guys had the picks, like like five picks in advance. Well, you got to pay. For, that's a, you got to subscribe or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if he's passed the physical yet or not, but I, there I have believe been questions. He has, and there's questions contract. about Todd Gurley's health and have been for now, you know, going into year three. So this is why when I when I was statting out Atlanta, I chose to give a, a soft uh, projection for Ty Gurley, I think compared to at least Jason, because I just don't, like I projected him for fewer carries in Atlanta than I than he had last year in, in Los Angeles. Um, that was more based around the team talking about the guys that they have and, you know, just trying to balance out that offense. But Gurley's a, a, a tough call. I don't think he's going to be on many of my teams this year. Yeah, he probably won't be on mine either. Uh, the Saints signed Ty Montgomery. I don't Alrighty. care. Yep. All yep. Right. Good for good for you, Ty. Yeah, yeah. Good nice. for you. That's a good he's team. Happy to I'd go rather to a, he's happy to go to a team that he says utilizes <laughs> rather win a, a uh, ring on that bench than another right. bench. <laughs> he, he wants to be utilized as a as a the weapon, not a necessarily a, a running back or a wide receiver. So you go to a coach like Peyton. All right. Um. How about this uh, hype train moment? Oh for you? yes, this one's gonna get going. This thing will be a bullet train before drafts. I wonder. Frank Reich, head coach of the Indianapolis Colts, said, "Quote: It wouldn't surprise me if there's a game this season that Naeem Hines has ten catches." Said that uh, Philip Rivers. We know this, right? He's got the ability to get the ball to the running back. Saw it with Eckler last year. Oh, so many targets for Eckler, and then. Uh, he said Naeem Hines will be very much integrated into the game plan on all three downs. That part's weird. He's not you been You didn't particularly... need to say that, Frank. <laughs> like, it's, uh, like Hines has been great as a pass-catching running back. Like He has excelled there for a couple years. Not, not so much the, the rushing part of the running back, but all right. It's three backs that... I hear Marlon Mack could be a good value. Jonathan Taylor is going to be awesome. And now uh, Naeem Hines is going to have 10 catches in a game. And, uh, you know, you worry that there's too much hype around a good team, which should be an improved offense with a great offensive line. If all three guys are involved, that's just bad for fantasy. At the end of the day, there won't be a value. Yeah, I think we the worry with Stewart or uh, with Taylor, not Jonathan Stewart, he's not back. Uh, the worry with Taylor is just, you know, is year one the year that you're going to get that payoff? Is he going to be a redraft pick worthwhile or not? And so certainly when you hear about one, what did they say? A one-one punch? Yeah. Mm -hmm. With Mac and Taylor. Jab, and jab. You, jab, jab. you got Hines in there and uh, it will be difficult. It'll be interesting to to watch. So Brooksy uh, did pull something up for us. Uh, Field Yates had tweeted out, out. Dirk Cutter talking about Todd Gurley that uh, as of May 14th, he had not taken a physical. Oh, well, I guess Which, Dirk really doesn't know. <laughs> and that would be uh, May That would be May 13th, 2015. <laughs> he hasn't taken a physical <laughs> since then. So we haven't had a good update on, on Gurley in quite some time. The thing is, is he, I mean, I, so I statted him out for 16, and the reality is he missed a game, but he finished the season healthy, right? I mean... He, he yeah for, so for Todd Gurley he, it's not like it's not like you know Eric Ebron who or, or or Trey Burton these guys who's signing to new teams and they're currently injured this is a guy who left the season healthy well because just... his injury is not a uh, it's not a bone break okay I'm out x amount of days it's a they have th when I heard the Rams talking about it they just they would never know when the knee would flare up and become an issue he would have weeks where like oh there's there's the old Todd Gurley that we we need for our team and then 
just weeks where he he could barely move the knee. Right? So it's 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 a really tough call for for Atlanta. I, I think he'll play all those games, but how can they really rely on him for 16 games to be a workhorse back? That's that's the bigger problem. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if they're going to try to. I think that's that's what we all have to to look at. I don't know if they're going to try to do that. Head coach gonna... on a hot seat with a one-year contract for your running back right. and garbage behind him says, we're giving it to Todd <laughs> until that knee blows up. That's what it says to me. Before we move into splaining ourselves, Explain those, want to thank today's sponsor, Manscaped. Look, you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of that hygiene, and that's why I love using my Manscaped. I, I feel like a new person. I feel clean. They have excellent technology over at Manscaped. They have released their Lawnmower 3.0. It's a waterproof, cordless body trimmer. And because of the ceramic blade and skin safe technology, snags are reduced. Uh, like you're safe. Th that's what you you can know when you're using the Manscaped product. Things are going to be safe in an area that need to be safe. And they've got a bunch of other things like like deodorants and just things that things that, things that help you feel fresh. So, guys, you got to go check out Manscaped, and they got a peak hygiene plan where subscribers can get a new lawnmower trimmer replacement blade refilled delivered every three months. Like I said, I have it. Uh, this, is, this is a product that I recommend to all my friends. They ask me, like, seriously, my Manscaped, use it? So, yes. Yes, I do. I'm glad they're a sponsor on the show. And you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code FOOTBALLERS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code FOOTBALLERS. I'm quite well, thank you. No. Clearly you are not. No rational person would do as you have done. Explain yourself. Mm. All right, let's kick it off. Time to explain yourself, Mr. Wright. Uh, we're going to start with DeAndre Hopkins. Now, Mike has, uh, I mean, we've all done the dance. We've all been very... <laughs> mm, very, very excited. Very, very excited. What? what is that voice? That was a Borat. That was a Borat reference. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, look, practically, as a Cardinal fan, thrilling to have DeAndre Hopkins on board. Great for Kyla Murray. You know, breakout season in the cards. But DeAndre Hopkins. Mm -hmm. Mike, you have him at 15. Jason has him up at five. Right now, he's being drafted as the wide receiver three in best ball leagues. There's a lot of excite, as Jason said. <laughs> yes. I'm kind of I'm kind of more on your side than Jason is. So I think he's the one that needs to say it. Okay, Mike, explain yourself. There you All go. right. Uh, the, the first thing I will say is here's uh, what a feature 15 that is, is low. 15 is low. Well, that's, that's what I want to address first off is it, like in our ultimate draft kit, you can see our actual player by player statistical breakdowns and see their points where a rank or if you're like, holy crap, Hopkins at 15, like he's really just a handful of points away from number nine. So like I could. I could give him a, a twenty yard reception, and he'll jump up to nine. But my point still stands that I think he is a lower end wide receiver one or a high end wide receiver two this year because of the target volume. Like, where? What do you do with Kyler Murray? Where last year, I mean, he had a, a great rookie year, but threw for thirty seven hundred yards. He threw the ball five hundred forty two times. Does he all of a sudden? explode with passing volume like <laughs> that's kind of weird but it, does he jump up like 100 passing attempts i i just don't see that as anywhere in in the realm of possibilities for kyler and he spreads the ball around like it, it, one it's you have hopkins trading teams that's not always necessarily the, the best situation right away but arizona played on three wide receiver sets on, on passing plays, three wide receivers were out there 39% of the time. Four wide receivers were out there 33% of the time. And what I'm I'm bringing that up because there's other guys out on the field. This isn't just Arizona running two wide receiver sets. They run a two wide receiver set uh, 
very, very low compared to everybody else in the NFL. Guys like Demir Bird, Keyshawn Johnson, they're both over, they were both over 40 targets last year because they're on the field and the play, and they're getting open in the play. I just don't see DeAndre Hopkins as elite as he is and coming in Arizona and immediately pulling another 30% target share. I just so I don't see that happening. I my my contention is that he doesn't need a 30% target share. I do 100% think the passing volume will go up for a second year Kyler Murray. Not a hundred, but how much passing attempts? But it, it was already uh, it's rookie year. Kyler Murray threw fifty more passes than Deshaun Watson. That was as a rookie. So if he goes up another fifty, you're talking about a potential hundred more targets. He doesn't need to have thirty percent. You look at Kyler in college with C.D. Lamb. They had the four wide receiver sets. This, this is a spread offense. But when you had a dominant one, he's going to go to him. And you bring up Demir Bird and these guys who are those are. Those are our point. That's my point. The competition, DeAndre Hopkins is the clear one here. And, you know, Christian Kirk and Larry Fitzgerald will be nice additions on the field. But I think this offense will hum. And I think, you know, you, you should have at least 140 targets going to Hopkins, which is low for Hopkins. That's what I, I have him for 140. Really? Yeah. I saw it. This 15. could. This could just be a case of I have other players that I I like. Well, uh, I like a, a bit more than Hopkins, but it, it's funny that it's funny how when you're breaking down statistics, like we can look at the exact same thing, <laughs> like the, all those targets for the auxiliary players. You see it one way, and I see it the other. Well, and you didn't mention Kenyon Drake or Dan Arnold or Isabella in the year two. Hakeem Butler. There are sure. other weapons that they want to use, and it's not to take away from Hopkins. But you're not going to have an you're not going to have a traditional training camp this year. You're not going to have the kind of uh, you know, look. I don't know how hard it is to form a mind meld with one of the NFL's best wide receivers, but you will not have that in advance the way you might have had in a normal training camp for Kyler and Hopkins to get on the same page, which is a piece of the puzzle, right? No matter what, yes. You know uh, how how good of a wide receiver you are, but it's it's a situation where Hopkins is traditionally viewed in that top two three four five range so you are making a judgment with the team transition whether or not you buy hop buy into the fact that hopkins can can stay at that level i have him at nine that's just where he ended up landing in, in my rankings but uh i do i arizona distributes the ball a little bit more than i think uh they do in in Houston. Yeah, I think the distribution, the 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 way. At least we only have one year of of Kyler playing, of course. But d him and Deshaun Watson, they play very very differently. And like, and Watson came into the NFL with with DeAndre Hopkins as his. That was the safety blanket. That's how he learned the end of that NFL system th his entire career. Where I like, I don't think Larry is going away as as a guy. How, how many targets do you have, Jason? It, it, if you have your Arizona guys pulled up, how many targets do you have going to Larry? I've got 99 targets to Larry, okay. as well as 114 to Christian Kirk. Oh wow, that's yeah, it's more more for both of those guys than than I have, but I could see that. I mean, Kirk last year, 107 and 13 games. Hopkins obviously comes in and demands the majority of of that, but they were bad around the goal line. They could not yes. get the that, ball that into the true. end zone, and that could be the area of efficiency that improves. Hopkins so, had seven last year. I have him for seven this year. Jay, you have you basically have then, uh, I'm assuming, like all those ancillary targets almost all just going to Hopkins then. Yeah, like Andy is forming, Bella, forming a vulture. Uh, Andy, Andy is Isabella, Hakeem Butler. Those ancillary pieces are, are dead in my rankings. I just, you know, I've got Isabella with 13 receptions, Hakeem Butler okay. with 18. They're, you know, I, I think it's going to be really the. The the three of these guys and and Drake taking taking the the offense forward. All right, all right. Well, it, it's going to be fun to watch. I hope it means more wins. And I think people listening at home can understand. It does not bring me any sort of joy to, to be talking about DeAndre Hopkins like this. Well, it, and the one name that I did bring up that did has transitioned teams a couple times and put up huge target numbers was Brandon Marshall. You know, he sure. was an example of one that could do that. Yeah, it's not impossible. But it's if just, I bet on one side, there are more variables in play for Hopkins at the top of the wide receiver ranks than there are other players for me. 
Yeah, that that's fair. But you have seen Hopkins transition not from team to team, but from quarterback to quarterback, quarterback, to quarterback. Yeah. and always be great because because yeah. he's dominant. All right, Mike, great. I'm going to let you take this next one away because you are the highest, and you can you can uh, give Andy the business. Oh, oh, excellent. I wasn't sure who I had to go after because I also have to go after you. For, <laughs> somebody, for you always one. have to go after somebody, Mike. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, you, you know. All right, so we're we're talking about a uh, player who is one of four wide receivers to ever post a hundred <laughs> re- receptions and fourteen hundred yards in a season before turning twenty three. We are talking about a player who has been a stud a stud in mm. two out of three years he lost his quarterback he lost everything last year he was injured himself but andrew holloway mm. has juju smith schuster at wide receiver 29 explain yourself explain yourself sir jason has him at 13 mike has him at seven look first of all it, it, you know Juju should be explaining himself to me. Oh. <laughs> that that's that's my contention. I came into last year telling you that I thought Juju Smith Schuster would take a step back. That those numbers that he put up with Antonio Brown flanked outside, Lev Bell in the backfield, a healthy, younger Big Ben, they, those were coming down last year no He's matter what. He's a year younger. Those those were coming who was? Big Ben. I'm just <laughs> saying like Well, he's two at- he's two years removed from that season at this point. Sure. Okay, but but uh, you know, I came in last year and I said, "Look, Juju's one of my picks to to regress from where everyone wants him." Last year, he was the fifth wide receiver off the board. His ADP was the top of the second round. People were buying the highest point of the stock, in my opinion, last year. Then he comes out, hot, wet fart of a season. I mean, just bad. Yeah, they had substance, and you don't want that. Uh, <laughs> There was particles, mm-hmm. uh, and so, but, but, but the kind of the the broad brush, the sweeping, which clearly you two have both appropriated to your rankings, is when you look at Juju bouncing back, is that uh, you know he just he just didn't have a good quarterback. Um, mind you, last year when you look at the the season, what do we do at the fantasy footballers? We say when you have a variable like that, a variable like that, you want to take a look at the player independent of the quarterback situation. And we put that into our ultimate draft kit. We have Matt Harmon's reception perception. We look at the player. We look at the route tree. We look at, are you winning? Well, Juju doesn't win a lot on the outside. He's a great slot wide receiver. But I've got some advanced data for you coming from Matt Harmon from this year's UDK. Last year, he fell below the 24th percentile in success rate versus man coverage. That's a third straight year under the 24th percentile. Fell below the 12th percentile in success rate versus press coverage for the third straight year. We needed to see him come Mm. out and be able to be a number one on the outside, and he was able to succeed in the slot because of what Antonio Brown affords you. We might need to look at, and I'm quoting... uh, friend of the show, Matt Harmon here, we might have to look at Juju in the vein of the Jarvis Landry type, a great, successful, potential high volume, really good player, going to have big games because he can take the ball to the house from uh, you know an inside slant. But I don't look at him. He graded out, by the way, 85th of 122 last year at the wide receiver position. His teammate, Deontay Johnson, was 20 spots ahead of him, according to Pro Football Focus. So it wasn't just a quarterback last year. He had a down year overall and he played in 12 of 16 games. So it is a bounce back bet that you're looking at for Juju. And because I wasn't in on him as a number one last year, I'm not going to take another year of big Ben, not established outside weapons and look at Juju and say, yeah, you get the, you get the benefit of the doubt. I'm giving you that top five, top six, or sorry, top 10 ranking. I'm just not willing to do that. I think he can have big games, but I have him much lower than I think pretty much anybody in the industry because I just don't believe he has what it takes to be a one in the offense. Uh, and I'll jump in because uh, what I heard what you were saying, so for the third straight year, he fell below certain metrics. So like when he put up 1,407, he was below that mark? 
Yeah, but he was playing slot with Antonio Brown on the outside. And, I, and honestly, I think the moves that the, the team has made, they allow Juju to go back to where he is most comfortable. And that it's fine. If if all he is is a awesome slot wide receiver, all right. That that's that's what he is. He can still put up massive numbers. Like it it won't surprise me to see you know, either James Washington and Deontay Johnson on the outside and then that could Juju certainly in, happen in the slot or they have they drafted like a monster of a man in the second round, Chase Claypool here, to, who the, he would be an outside wide receiver. That guy's not going in the slot uh, with, certainly, with his certainly with his size. And I'm just I know we're I know we're a, a year removed again from for, uh, for Big Ben lost an entire year. But that season you're talking about two years ago, Big Ben led the league in passing yards. Like Big Ben over the last five years averages over 300 passing yards per game. I'm just, I'm, it, this isn't just a bet on Juju for me. It's all, it's a bet that Big Ben can still come in here and get it done. And he's out there throwing NFL passes, getting his beard shaved, and who's he throwing yeah. it to? It wasn't Deontay Johnson well, out there with sure. him. It was sure. Juju. Well, if you remember last year too, one of the contentions that people tried to make with Juju was this idea that, oh my goodness, what if the touchdowns go up because those yardage mm -hmm. is not going to happen. But you got Claypool, you got Ebron, you have different weapons now too. Where, you know, what's Jarvis Landry known for? He's not for for you know red zone utility. I'm not saying that Juju can't perform, but there are rumors around. This is a contract year for Juju, as well. Is he a part of the future plans for Pittsburgh? Is this going to become Deontay Johnson's team or, or Claypool or somebody else's? Are they going to pay for a slot receiver the money that Juju will want at 23 years old? Right. And does that change the way they use him in the offense? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm just giving you the the math behind what I viewed as anecdotal observations of his game, which is that game-breaking type of player, but I don't think he's one. So we have a pretty big disparity on him. Yes, uh, we do. Allen Robinson, Jason. Allen Robinson, good friend of the show. Great friend of the show. Great friend of Blake Bortles. Big Al. Is Big Al. Call him. Big, do we? Uh, he hates that. Um, Jason <laughs> has him down at 20. Mike and I have him uh, uh, on the outside of the wide receiver. One range, Mike at 10. I'm at 12. So, Jason, with him down at 20, explain yourself. Explain yourself. Look, I, I think this is uh, this so is you pretty are easy. Yourself. This is pretty easy to explain. Uh, I think Allen Robinson is a great player. I think he's the one for the Bears, and I think what you had last season is peak. And I'm certainly not saying he can't get back there, but that's not my expectation, right? I mean, last year he had the fifth most targets in the league, with only 118 of those being deemed catchable because you got bad quarterback play and I don't think the bad quarterback play is going away Trubisky's still there and yes maybe it maybe it shifts to Foles but does it Foles hurt them only if... looks good by comparison to Trubisky not necessarily <laughs> like this is not like Foles is here he's got the best quarterback ever I was gonna Robinson ask you has never played a single snap with a good quarterback that that's absolutely his true. life <laughs> and he's had now two seasons where he's finished great and other seasons where he's he's you know he's been a solid wide receiver or been injured. Great, no, you have 1,400 yards and 14 touchdowns. Like, no, guys, just, people just do that every once in a while. So here's that's an outrageous th line, man. Here's the th that is an outrageous line. Back, you're talking back when he was a, a Jaguar breaking out. Absolutely, I, I remember those days long ago. Um, <laughs> but but the reality is this: last year the targets came because of decimation to the receiving options for the Bears. If you look at his target volume over the beginning, you know, the first nine weeks of the season when the team was relatively healthy, you lost Trey Burton in week 10. You lost uh, Taylor Gabriel in week 13. Look at the targets. Did they ever in those, find Trey Burton? <laughs> uh, they, they, they found him, another team. He surfaced yes, uh, okay. over on the Colts. And I've been like, looking oh, there for him. Is. I just wasn't sure. Uh, but the point is, is that look at those last five games when there were no other options to throw the ball to. He was uh, you know, he was on pace for 186 targets because, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, he was a monster at the, at the end. He was the only guy, but now look at their off season moves. We don't like yeah, Jimmy Graham. Ted Ginn, Ted Ginn and Jimmy Graham, older guys, but that are coming in and are going to take receptions away. And, and you also uh, draft Cole Komet. This is a team that has uh, tight ends have been a, a predominant part of 
what they want to do, and they haven't been healthy enough to do it. Two years ago, Trey Burton had 74 targets. Uh, Taylor Gabriel had 94 targets, and and those were the number two and number three options. Now you've got Anthony Miller, who's getting better. They brought in Ted Ginn. They've brought in Jimmy Graham. There are other options to throw the ball to. I mean, two years ago, he was on a 16-game pace, Allen Robinson, with this team, with those other weapons, a 16-game pace of 116 targets. So it's just a matter of, do you honestly think he's going to be this 155, I, 60 target guy? I, I've got him with 140 targets. That's solid, but he's got he's getting 140 targets from a bad quarterback, I and that puts him use, as a wide receiver two. I wouldn't use Jimmy Graham, and I wouldn't. Yeah, say I, I wouldn't I use Ted out. Ginn. I'm fine with the regression of targets, but I wouldn't. I, Ted well, Ginn hasn't stolen has targets be, from anybody in in 12 years. There has to be a reason for a regression of targets, and when you when well, you how got about the Taylor, emergence of Anthony Miller? You want to go the emergence of Anthony Miller over a five game span last year over the back half of the year? That I can buy. Sure, but I mean, okay, let me ask you this: Does Jimmy Graham get more or less than 60 targets this season? Honestly, I have no idea. I don't know uh, if Jimmy fewer. Graham gets on the field for more than fewer. three or four games. Well, what do you have him statted for? Right? I mean, we 50. You've got him statted for 50? That is correct. 52 targets is what I have him. Okay. For. So I and I've got I've got him right at 60. But I mean so mm -hmm. those are those are targets that are that he's getting. Is he good with those? No. He's not going to do much. Should they throw him the ball 50 or 60 times? No. But they're paying him big money. So when I say that the target regression is coming and I bring up Jimmy Graham's name, yeah, we roll our eyes at it. The Bears don't the Bears gave a lot of money to a guy to come in and get the ball thrown to him 50, 60 times. Those passes, when they go to someone else, can't also go to Allen Robinson. So well, I, I that see him play, as a, But then the next three plays will go to Allen the, Robinson. There isn't a next three plays because they threw to Jimmy Graham, <laughs> and now it's fourth down. <laughs> so I've got him as a wide receiver, too. Um, I'd be happy with him as my wide receiver, too. I would not be happy if I went running back, running back, Allen Robinson as my one. You know, that that is a good question, Mike, because we even even you and I have him out, you know, not as low as Jason, but we have him on the outside of our wide receiver one by rankings. But I think I agree with Jason on that point. I don't think I want Allen Robinson as the one on my team. Do you feel comfortable well, with him as your one? Well, if you go running back, running back, what wide receivers left in that range are you actually happy that you have as a one? I mean, that can't be more than a list of two players. Well, right, let if, me ask if you the draft goes your way, Hopkins will be there. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. true. <laughs> let me let me let me ask you this, Mike, because you you've been um you know the 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 highest on these two players. You're up, and it's in the third round, and Juju's there, and Allen Robinson are there. Who would you rather take? Ooh, I do have Juju projected, you know, slightly higher. I think I would probably go like he. Let's say it's my wide receiver one. I I would probably go Allen Robinson at that point, just of the. He's a bit safer, you know. That like, yep. Big Ben is coming back off an injury. Like, I I can't ignore that. That's not a a real thing. If I'm comparing him to Allen Robinson, so yeah, I would probably go with Robinson. But if I went running back, running back, I would be really happy that I had Allen Robinson as my wide wide receiver one. All right, I want to pull the judge here for a second. Uh, if he's with us, Judge Giamatti, you present? Oh yeah, Allen Robinson or DJ Chark? Who are you more comfortable with as your one? Oh, I'll take Chark. Oh, you happen, okay. You happen to pick a guy that I'm all about. That you're pretty year. high on? Yeah. Allen Robinson or Adam Thielen is your wide receiver one. Who are you more comfortable with, Brooks? I'll, I'll go A-Rob there. Okay. What do you What do you guys say? You want Robinson or you want Thielen as your one? I, I am the same as Brooks on both of those. Uh, I would go Chark, Robinson, Thielen. Yeah. I would, that I does would make sense. Robinson. All right. Uh, Melvin Gordon. Let's talk about Melvin Gordon for a second here. You go player by player, team by team. You walk through these running backs, and I was surprised at how high I had Melvin Gordon when I when I broke down what the Broncos do on offense and what I think Gordon's going to be given the opportunity to do. He ended up at 14. Jason has him at 15. I was a little surprised. Mike's got him down at 24, and uh, you know he's still in the backfield with Royce Freeman, and, and he's in the backfield with Philip Lindsay. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, you've got him at 24, therefore... I just got a call from Melvin. He said, <laughs> respectfully, explain well, yourself. It's for me with Melvin Gordon. A lot of it has to do with those other two guys. Like last year, we saw 358 about carries from the running back position in Denver. 
Philip Lindsay, who is coming off of back to back thousand yard seasons, I know that they're they they bolstered the running back depth chart, but he is he's not just going to vanish into thin air. And I I contend that the same is for Royce Freeman. Like Freeman may they may not be on the field a ton, but he definitely eats into the the workload or the the potential that we've been used to with with Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon is still a massive injury risk. We have one season of seeing 16 games with Melvin Gordon. He's seen over 200 carries just twice in his five-year career. And then you have the the variable of going from the the king. Phil Rivers is the king of checking down to the running back position to Drew Locke, who, small sample, but Drew Locke, that, that was not his game. He he wasn't all about just feeding his running backs a a ton of of targets, which to me Melvin Gord would need very sustained target volume if he's going to get back into that conversation of being a high end running back too. On top of that, he's just he's an inefficient running back. He's been over four yards in attempt one time in his entire five seasons. Like maybe Melvin Gordon's just not that good. Oh, you know where he is good. He's good around the goal line, man. I mean, he is good at getting touchdowns. You could say whatever you want about uh, why they came or whether they're repeatable or if it's a sticky stat, but he has been pretty solid at, at putting up touchdowns. Uh, He's when he had gets a lot opportunity. of a t- opportunities to score touchdowns. And I believe Denver will give him the opportunity, and they they paid him in a manner that says they will. It was ironic. Uh, you know, we, we did this research here, and we found uh, if – for running backs that see 250 touches and eight total touchdowns, passing and receiving, uh, are they a top 15 running back? And uh, the Borgogan monster went out and, and researched this back over the last five years, and pretty much they always are. I won't read you every year, but over the last five years, out of 46 running backs to see 250 touches and eight touchdowns, 93% in as a top 15 running back. And, and so you say it needs the passing volume work. I, I think, I think you know, I'm not going based on a five-game sample size for Drew Locke uh, about whether or not he'll throw to Melvin Gordon, but I think they're paying him enough to give him the ball 250 times and give him the opportunities uh, of touchdowns. That's why they brought him in. So I was surprised, uh, just like Andy. When I, when I finished my rankings, I didn't think I liked Melvin Gordon, and I was like, oh, all right. I just I think he's going he's to paid to get work. Have him get I, I have him literally at 250 on the dot. I am at 225, but still getting there because I don't think there's another running back out there on third down. They paid him the money. He's going to be out there on third down, and I think that's just going to end up putting him over that 250 touch number that Jason's talking about. Um, efficient or not, you know what I mean? They, some a, a lot of these NFL teams, the philosophical view is we hate it as fantasy football players sometimes because all we have are the analytics above us. But from a philosophical standpoint, they just – believe in putting the ball in one guy's hand over and over again for what it does to break a defense down, for what it does for pass protection, for whatever the case may be. I I, I found myself in that camp with Gordon. Do you have where we have him ranked in the range of outcomes, Mike, if, if things oh, go yeah, the right yeah, way? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. certainly. I mean, he's, once again, he, where my rank, uh, I have him. You give Melvin Gordon probably one to two more touchdowns and he'll he would jump right to where... You guys have him ranked. Okay. All right. You guys ready to move on? Yep. Now you're a man. A man, 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 man. <laughs> Are you introducing yourself? Well, I, let me just do it again. Now you're a man. A man, That's not, I'm not introducing myself with that. I'm not All a man. Right. Andy. Uh, I'm not Debo that kind Samuel. of a man. Debo Samuel had a, an incredible rookie year, had a moment, uh, you know, a, a stretch of games where he really appeared to break out. We have that drop for a reason. It looked like a man out there as a rookie, just absolutely <laughs> dominating, uh, throwing fools off, getting, you know, getting those screens and uh, breaking tackles. Now, this is a low passing offense. With Jimmy Garoppolo not wanting to throw the ball downfield, they bring in uh, Brandon Ayuk and uh, Ayuk. Ayuk and I, it basically just saying that sounds, you know, that I I was right there with get you. Get it, Mike. get in on it, man. It's I'm, fun. I'm in now. I was um, a little startled. I'll be honest. <laughs> Excellent. So the question is whether or not 
Debo is going to take that second year leap into being a really dominant fantasy asset. I think he's good. I have a hard time trusting the offense. I've got him at 29. Mike, you've got him up in the wide receiver two clear territory mm -hmm. at 22. And like he's him. got the full breakout coming. He's saying wide receiver 14 is where he's landing in his rankings right now. So on behalf of Mike and myself, Andy, <laughs> swing yourself. <laughs> I'd be happy to. I feel like Debo explained most of uh most of it for me every year you know Look, being like, a man can only get you so far <laughs> it can get you pretty far mike <laughs> here's the deal with debo uh you're right jason it's not a high passing volume offense it's an offense that's predicated on a great running game play action passes screen game uh and, and thank goodness that they have a player like debo samuel because there's no more uh exciting place on the field for Jimmy Garoppolo than 6.5 yards away from the line of scrimmage. And Debo just plain wins at that level. Y sure. You look at his success rate on screens and slants, and he's in the upper echelon, 86 percentile in, in his uh, slants, 100% in screen game. He was the number one graded runner at the wide receiver position by Pro Football Focus last year. What impressed me about Debo was that you don't have to bake in a some sort of second year leap in involvement to get a breakout. Debo was the wide receiver six in fantasy football from week eight on last year. The wide receiver six. I got him at fourteen. I'm insulting him with my ranking. The you are. The reality. <laughs> How is dare is you, Emmanuel Sanders? He's not there, and I'm not going to – I think that's kind of neutral. I don't think – someone might want to go narrative street and say, well, now Emmanuel's gone and Debo's the one. Well, I, okay, Debo's got his role to play. He's going to run the football, screen game, slant game. Maybe he matures. You know, he, he was – good success rate on post routes. Maybe he, he earns some more targets. But he's a yak master. That's his game. I mean, he gets the ball in his hands, and he finds a way to score. And at the end of the day, look, Debo, year two – Heavy part of this offense, I just think you're going to see more of the same. And, it, you know, it's not that wide receiver six level, but he had 10 drops last year. You guys can remember this. He had one on Monday Night Football, about a 30 yard mm -hmm. touchdown pass. No one was around him in the end zone. And I remember coming on this show the next week and saying, if he catches that pass, the perception of Debo Samuel over the back half of the year is completely different than if he doesn't. And sometimes for, you know, heading into a new year, you've got to, you got to be willing to take the chance on a, a less proven player. And so Debo is somebody I would draft over Juju, even though we've seen that humongous breakout season from Juju before and we haven't from Debo. Fix a few drops, increase those target numbers a little bit. Even if you don't, I think wide receiver 14 is a pretty comfy spot unless he gets hurt. So I'm feeling good with him there. I don't hate it. I have him at 22. Yeah, you don't hate it, Mike. No. You know oh, what? <laughs> I like, you know, man, he's a man. Yeah, I mean, if Jason moves him up five or six spots, I'd be willing to hit that drop. But oh, here's oh, Jay. Here's the thing. Uh, Just so you know, get, everybody, uh, everybody uh, on my rankings, also man. So <laughs> currently, <laughs> NFL requires. Uh, yeah, but not like Debo. No, man. look, I, I hope you're. I hope you're right, Andy. And I would. I feel like I would draft him ahead of where I've got him at 29 for the potential, uh, you know, you want to, especially once you're past those first few rounds, you know, we, we tend to swing for the fences, go high upside. The upside is what you described with Debo. And if he does, you know, clearly go into that wide receiver one role and dominate targets, I've only got him at like 108 targets. It's hard to get from there to a, a dominant fantasy finish. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he's going to get, the kind of target volume you'd see from a prototypical wide receiver one by any stretch of the imagination. The way he has to put it together, I mean, last year, what, 81 targets, 57 catches, still over 800 yards on those 57 catches, but he's going to have to do it in the Percy Harvin type of uh, role. Yeah, Not, that's a good comp. You know, that that's kind of who he is. But he's one of the players, you know, him and Calvin Ridley. I know we all like Calvin Ridley. Those are mm -hmm. players that I'm really excited to watch on the field in 2020. Uh Another man, Jonu Smith. <laughs> this is Jason's uh, flag plant at the tight end position, without question. I've got him at 19. Mike has him at 12. 
I don't, I'm not going to sit here and debate the athleticism or gifts Jonu Smith has shown on the football field. Consistency has been the issue. Uh, Jason strong armed us into the breakout selection of Jonu Smith for the UDK. Jason has him at seven. Explain yourself. I remember early in the offseason last year having to explain myself about a little man named oh, Mark here Andrews. We go. Here we go. And I remember two years ago having to explain myself about my ranking of Jared Cook. And this year, All I right, I do remember that one too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 he, I believe he finishes the tight end one. Um, uh, this year, I was surprised, just like I was surprised by Cook, just like I was surprised by Mark Andrews when I went through statting guys out. I was like, holy Jonu Smith. He's up at seven. That feels way too high. I'm literally looking at my stats like I need to move him down because I'm I'm uncomfortable saying he's number seven, but he has the skill set to do it. You guys remember when Derrick Henry got injured and they're like, it's okay, we'll give the ball to Jonu. Yeah. And then he's running the ball like a beast because, Andy, you brought this up. He is an athletic freak. He's 250 pounds. He's 93rd percentile spark athlete. You know, his, his 40, his burst score, everything is, is you know, up in the 90 percentile. He hasn't done it for several years, but we've brought this up so many times. There are uh, there are a lot of examples of tight ends needing several years, not the year two breakout, um, before they, they get their chance and dominate. And if you think about it, he's been behind Delaney Walker his entire career until a stretch of games last year starting in week what, seven. Wasn't and it he didn't, most of the year last year? Yeah, starting in week seven. So John, okay. uh, Delaney Walker was there the first six weeks. Starting in week seven and on, he was out on the field. But this wasn't the plan. It was still Delaney Walker's game. And so this was this was it's his not the plan. This was the first chance of him really getting out there and getting that experience. I think that experience is going to propel him for a team that utilizes the tight end in a pass catching role. He's got gifts. His yards per reception were fantastic. He caught almost eighty percent of his game. balls. He had a 3.7 yards of separation, uh, you know, which was uh, dominant. That was what Tyler Higby had last year, according to uh, Next Gen Stats. I think he has the skill set and the opportunity with Delaney Walker gone with the what looks to be a solid offense. And I love the fact that they do get him involved in the in the running game. He, you know, you say okay, maybe he's got 600 receiving yards. Well, if he's got another hundred, you know, plus yards on the ground. That adds up for for a tight end landscape where again we you know we talk about this. If you have the tight end seven on your team, you're probably not happy week in and week out with that. He's not you know he's not up there in the the you know the every week starter. But I think Jonu is going to have a breakout season this year. My stats you know I just let the the chips fall where where they fall, and uh, at, I had Jonu at seven at the tight end position. Breakout so often equates to consistency on some level. Because so few tight ends actually can do that. I am certainly marked by disappointment not seeing that from Joni last year when Delaney went down. And it was kind of the, now's your time. But he's young. He's 24 years old. If you buy the argument That's that, look, insane. this was the, uh, you know, not the plan, as you said. This offseason, Narrative Street has him and Tannehill already working out together. But you cannot be a top tight end and drop, you know, give me a number 12 or a number seven finish and then give me a 50 or a, a 40 and be completely eliminated from the game plan. That's kind of a concern with all Tennessee players in the passing game is are you going to be eliminated for a week or two at a time when the Derrick Henry Express gets rolling? Will Joni be needed each and every week? Certainly a, a an athletic uh, after catch type of player but so, I'm worried about the consistency. Yeah, and and I and I get that. But you know, if you look, th those first six weeks were irrelevant because he was he was the backup tight end. Once he got that role, um, you know, and and you go from seven to sixteen, he was on pace for six hundred and eight yards and five touchdowns. And if you look at where that would put you, and that and that's not that's excluding his hundred rushing yard pace as well. You know, that's what Hunter Henry, you know, last year had six fifty two and five. Uh, Dallas Goddard had six oh seven and five. Um, that and he was already. Why, on why'd that you pace. leave week, week seventeen off? Because uh, he he took the he took week seventeen off. Because he took a dump ski on that week. <laughs> but he my was the point tight end twelve from that week on. If I leave one of his yes one of his games 
off. <laughs> just one. <laughs> I'm saying he showed, but that was his first one chance to need. do it. He now was he a comes tight in one. as the clear starter. Yeah. In that next year, as at 24 years old, I I, I think he's going to be. And don't I'm always going to take a don't player you want like a that. tight end. Yeah. Don't you want a tight yes. end that like he's yes. got the physical gifts that could just blow up? Yeah. Not everybody can do yes, that. Yes, he could. That don't don't take don't draft Jack Doyle anywhere. That's my right, me- yes. me- always take the Joni Smith or the Herndon or the Fant or Gesicki. Or the Blake Jarwin. Uh, don't take the Eifert or the uh, the Witten selection of the draft because you don't. Mark Andrews, George Kittle, these are guys that have won people leagues. At least draft the player that has the potential to do that, which mm-hmm. he falls into that that uh area so um no i mean the the argument makes sense so you you've definitely we'll see if i can go three and oh here on planted your flag with jonu i want to thank pristine auction for sponsoring today's podcast alvin Kamara signed jersey 86 dollars and 86 cents that's, oh. that's their promise to you you will always pay the same amount of dollars and the same amount of cents <laughs> If you bid it if, that way. If you want to. If nothing want is to. ever over $100. $112.112. <laughs> uh, $112. <laughs> <laughs> anything you want at Pristine Auction. That's the message. Get anything you want. But check them out. Use the code BALLERS. PristineAuction.com. You get a $10 credit towards your first sports memorabilia purchase. I just sold some sports memorabilia yesterday. You did. Some and, Kobe uh, Bryant rookie I found, cards, right? I found a bunch of cards in my... It was a fun Sunday afternoon activity. I pulled out dusty old boxes of cards from my garage and found some old Kobe Bryant cards. And now my son, my eight-year-old and I, we've decided we're going to collect uh, football cards. Nice. And make a little... So Are was, football cards a thing? They're very much a thing. Really? They were, yeah. They were, they were around back when we were younger, too, Jay. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I I don't know if you uh if you you either of you guys follow Gary V. Oh. No. Nope. Okay. I know yeah. who he is, but big I, entrepreneurial yeah. public speaker uh, flying around Facebook that type of guy. His number one You can in, fly around Facebook. You can fly all over. That's how big you, it is. You can fly all over <laughs> Facebook. If you're in a video form, Mike, you can get you can get share flown all around right. the country. But he's he's uh, recent. He's the one who inspired me to even go look at my cards again because I hadn't thought about sports cards in about twenty years. But he thinks that they're like the next big investment, like sneakers. You know, you talk about the sneaker game, those mm-hmm. sneaker documentaries. A lot of people are buying rookie cards and Wait, resell. cards are coming back. They're coming back in a big way. Oh crap! I have no idea where my cards are. I know, I know. I didn't either. I, by the way, if Glenn Robinson became mm. a really big thing i'd be the richest man on this earth because apparently i've got about nine million glenn <laughs> robinson big dog rookies big dog glenn robinson didn't really pan out that must have been my card collecting year but he was solid yeah he wasn't that bad was right a good vet but yeah, his those, rookie card ain't worth yeah. jack so <laughs> all right uh that'll do it for today's episode of the show thank you for tuning in i feel like we sufficiently explained ourselves i'm exhausted so We'll be back on Thursday. (laughs) See you then. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.